And so if you have a lightsaber in one hand, you can say, may the force be with you, right? So you don't have to hold the lightsaber under your armpit like this and then something bad could happen. Hello, Troy. Thanks so much for being with us today here at Nerdist. Oh, thank you so much for having me. We're really interested to know how your uh, involvement with The Mandalorian came about and what that experience was like. So it was an amazing story. So the deaf community is so small as far as networking connections. And so there was someone by the name of Kim Richards. And Kim Richards was the first assistant AD who worked with Dave Finloni. And so it just so happened they were discussing finding someone who could teach sign language on the show. And so they were, they looked for one. And so then they reached out to someone. They had learned sign language from a teacher in community college. And that teacher had a lot of connections in the deaf community because that teacher was involved as an educator and in very, in many meetings. And so she knew that my wife was a teacher and an actor. And so this person reached out to my wife, Deanne, and said, hey, were you interested in being the, the ASL master on Star Wars? And my wife heard that. She said, wait a minute. I'm so busy right now. I'm not available, but I know someone who might be. And at that moment, she looked over at me. And so I was watching a football game on TV and enjoying the football game. And my wife said, hey, Troy, I have a job for you. And I was like, what job? You know, she was always asking me to like help teaching her students sign language and some administrative type jobs or duties. She goes, Troy, it's related to Star Wars. And so I got the remote, I shut the TV off and I said, okay, I'm all eyes, tell me more. And so that's where it all started. And so that led to arriving on set. And so I brought an interpreter with me because I was trying to figure out how we could communicate and make sure that we're comfortable and have a comfortable setup. So I brought an interpreter along and we showed up on set and I met Dave Finloni. And Dave Finloni had a cowboy hat on and I was looking around and I see him kind of walking over with his cowboy hat. And he said, hi, and he gave me a very firm handshake and we had a chat and I asked him, what is your vision as far as communication? And he said, really, think about cowboys and Indians. And when they would first meet, how would they communicate? So think about the Tuscan Raider representing the Indians and the Mandalorian is like the cowboy. And so how would they communicate with each other when they don't speak the same language? And so that gave, and so they gave me a script and I read through it. And so I was helping consult on the show. And later on, he didn't realize that I was an actor myself because I didn't want to say, hey, by the way, I'm an actor. You know, it would just sound like I was brown nosing. I really wanted to focus on the sign language. But my manager let them know and said, hey, by the way, Troy is also an actor. Why doesn't he play a Tuscan Raider? They'd offered me a role because they didn't realize that I was also an actor. And so I was, rather than teaching two hearing actors sign language, why don't I play one of the Tuscan Raiders? And then only one person needs to learn sign language in, in that way. And so they had not thought of that solution. And so it was a great step forward. And after that happened, and I was a Tuscan Raider, believe it or not, the deaf community, everyone out there in the deaf community was sending me messages that they were so thrilled to finally see an authentic deaf actor cast in the Star in the Star Wars franchise. There hadn't been since 1977 when Star Wars was born. And so that's why, you know, imagine seeing so many aliens who speak different languages and come from different cultures and all of the above. But where was gesturing or sign language? And so the Tuscan Raider was the perfect opportunity to show sign language because at that moment, it was just about five seconds and Star Wars A New Hope. I remember that moment when the Tuscan Raider came up behind them and there was two of them, two folks with guns and the Tuscan Raider taps one on the shoulder. And when they looked over, at that moment, I felt a connection because of that gesturing. It was just a small moment in the 77 film. And so I was so glad to finally incorporate more and that John Favreau 
and Dave Finloni were able to think about that and that the Tuscan Raider should have its own type of gesturing or sign language. And so really, I was so thrilled to have been involved in the whole process. And I really miss, miss playing the Tuscan Raider. It was so fun because you have no facial expressions and really you have to use a lot of body language, which deaf people are very sensitive to. You'd think with C-3PO knowing six million forms of communication or whatever it is, that certainly C-3PO must know some signed languages. Yeah, you know, I didn't think about that. I've never considered that, you know? Most of it comes through sound, right? And so it doesn't bother me that he knows 6,000 languages, but I never thought that maybe C-3PO was missing or that his computer chip needs some updating maybe. Well, and also C-3PO, as well as the Tuscans you mentioned and the Mandalorians, have they don't show facial expressions. So I'm curious then how different that is from ASL if you can't have the facial expressions as part of the communication. So I used to host workshops in the past as far as gesturing. And, the t and as a teacher, Sometimes when I was taking workshops, the instructor would force me to put a mask on and said, hey, how can you demonstrate this? You know, you need to use more of what you have inside of you with body language and facial movements. And so that was great. I remembered that acting workshop and I would use the same technique because, of course, with the Tuscan Raider, you don't have facial expressions. It really depends on the situation and body language. Sometimes you might have a bit softer of, of a response. Sometimes you might have some more emotion. But what about a joke? Like when the when the Tuscan Raiders look at the vehicle when it pulls up, you might have a humorous moment. And so you have these, these moments. And so you really, you know, I'm quite sad that we're not seeing the Tuscan Raiders for a while, maybe until the next season. I'm really looking forward to it because I'm always ready and I'm always on standby to support them. Yeah, I noticed that you're credited in episode, I think, five of Mandalorian. And then they do have gesturing languages later in Mandalorian and also in Book of Boba Fett. Did you work with them during those programs too? Yes, I did. So there was a lot of similarities. So what's interesting was I did my homework and my research to make it clear that I never used any ASL. So right now what you see, I'm signing an ASL. So I can't imagine that Tuscan Raiders would communicate in ASL because it's too advanced. And what's really important was to set that aside and think about their desert environment and their homeland and as well as their, their clothing and their heavy gloves. So you can't really do this type of finger spelling with heavy gloves on. And so that becomes a gesture that really fits their desert climate and culture and language and their you know vehicles and so on. So I'm really hoping that I wanted to create something that the international community could understand and you could reach out to folks in different countries. So from my personal experience here in America, we use ASL. And so if I went on a flight and went to Japan, Deaf people use a different type of sign language over there. So there's over 300 different types of sign languages internationally just here on planet Earth. So I wanted to design a type of sign language that could really reach out to everyone internationally and all of those languages. So I wanted to keep the gestures as open as possible. And it was really fun for me to research that. And so I would, how the process worked is I would give them three different options for one specific line and say, okay, option A, B, or C. And I'd send them these options and they'd say, okay, I really like B. So we'd keep B as the sign for one specific line or phrase. And so sometimes they might have forgotten one and, and sent another extra line or an extra prop maybe, like for example, a gun. So with one hand, you might be holding a gun. So what is the Tuscan Raider going to sign with their other hand? You don't want them to drop the gun. So you have to come up with a one-handed sign and you play around with the props. And so that really gives them more options that way. And it's a lot more fun to go through the process. And that's that's how we did it. And so what you see on there is, is basically comes from all that. And there's another example I have. So going, so this could be land or area. And so in ASL, it would be your bike crosses the landscape or your motorbike crosses the landscape. And so 
crossing the land, right? And so that's the concept. And so it's like the simplification because think about their sand dunes that they have. So you have to create signs that really fit their specific climate and the desert environment. Well, and there's also in each episode, it's a little different the way they're using it when they're sitting down with Mando and uh, the marshal who doesn't know this gesturing language. And then later with Boba Fett, there's all these different applications of it. And so the fact that it changes for all of those, sometimes they are speaking out loud, sometimes they're not. I noticed even for Disney Plus, sometimes it's translated, captioned, and sometimes it's not. Right, it's a really great way to develop communication between Boba Fett and the Tusken Raiders in the book of Boba Fett. And in that way, you can really show how they grow and they relate they find a way to communicate ultimately. And that leads to the Mandalorian learning some of their sign language. So it's really fascinating. And finally, we're able to develop a language and then you see it in process. Are there some signs that you could teach me? I know that there are some where I can sort of tell, you know, kill or train. There were some, are there others? Okay, so this is the sign for Tuscan Raider because of the bandoliers across their chest, right? So that's the sign for Tuscan Raider. At first I tried this and it was a little odd. And I tried this and it didn't really work. And then maybe, you know, their clothing, different signs related to their clothing, but the bandoliers that they're wearing across their chest, they all have them. So it's easy to identify the Tuscan Raiders in that way. And so, we had to go through these signs and have the producers approve them. And so that was locked. So the sign for Tuscan Raider. And then in several episodes, it just so happened there was no. This was the sign for no. So I had to go back to the first one and made sure that we were consistent and used the same sign for no. And so we didn't want to forget and set them aside and create different signs for something as basic as no. It wouldn't make sense. You know, that would mean I didn't do my homework and didn't have consistency. So it was really important to make notes on all of the signs we added and have similarities. So then going back, we'd have consistency. When you showed up on set where there are already signs for Star Wars words, you know, outside of the universe, you know, at Lucasfilm, do they, is there accepted signs for Star Wars rather than finger spelling or may the force be with you? Those sorts of terms that don't have direct translations. Sure, I've seen some signs that are really interesting. So when I went to the Fandom Festival, um, there was members of what they call the 501 Legion. And I went to their convention and I met many of them. And there was someone who knew sign language there. So I was actually in shock and I said, hey, that's really cool. And so she was dressed up and of course, and was signing to me. And so I signed back with her and she said, okay, Mandalore. And we became friends by the end of the convention. And she gave me a few ideas. And so may the force be with you. This is how she signed it. May the force be with you. So this represents the force, this hand shape and the energy of the force. And this represents a person. Okay. And so may the force be with you. Okay. And so I really liked that. I thought that was very interesting. And so I told her, hey, one challenge is what if you, you had to use one hand for a lightsaber? How are you going to sign May the Force Be With You if it's a two-handed sign? And so maybe another option would be with one hand. So maybe I could say, May the Force Be With You, like that. May the be. And so if you have a lightsaber in one hand, you can say, May the Force Be With You, right? So you don't have to hold the lightsaber under your armpit like this and then something bad could happen, right? <laughs> so we were discussing it, but... I thought that was a pretty good idea. Yeah. It depends on the situation. So if we're sitting down and you're having drinks at a bar, you might sign May the Force Be With You and you can set your drink down. But if you're fighting and you're in combat, there's no time to use two-handed sign. You might need to use one. So that's what I consider as uh, an ASL master or an ASL consultant on these shows. So you have to make the right decision based on the props. What, what are you holding in your other hand? Could talk about this all day. So if you have any other things you'd love to share, otherwise I want to make sure we wrap up. <laughs> yeah, sure. Let's do it again next time. I'd be happy to have another conversation. We can do part two of the interview later on. <laughs> <laughs>